You're listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us for another segment. We're going to be speaking with returning guest, Dr. Bruce Sands. He's joining us here from Mount Sinai Hospital. He's going to talk about some data that was presented at the 16th Congress of European Crohn's and Colitis Organization from a trial that evaluates biologic induction and maintenance therapy for moderately to severe active ulcerative colitis. Welcome back to Health Professional Radio. Dr. Bruce Sands, thank you for returning. Thank you very much, Neil. For our listeners who may not be familiar with you as a contributor, why don't you uh, give our listeners a bit of your professional background and then provide a brief overview of uh, ulcerative colitis. Sure. I'm I'm the chief of the Division of Gastroenterology at Mount Sinai in New York. Uh, The Division of Gastroenterology spans the entire health system, a neat hospital system. And Mount Sinai is well known for its work in inflammatory bowel disease, having been the place where Burl Crohn described Crohn's disease back in the 1930s. What causes ulcerative colitis and who's affected? Ulcerative colitis is a chronic inflammatory condition of the large bowel. It affects the inner lining of the bowel and causes chronic inflammation with ulceration. And typically the symptoms include diarrhea and rectal bleeding and a variety of other symptoms such as urgency for bowel movements, and some general symptoms as well as fatigue. It's very impactful because it can affect anyone across the lifespan, but most typically will affect people uh, in their teens and 20s at the onset. Um, So this disease is very significant, and uh, the treatment for ulcerative colitis is directed against this inflammatory immune-mediated process. And we have a variety of of therapies that are directed at inflammation, including conventional therapies such as 5-aminosalicylates, which are orally administered and work fairly well for mild to moderate ulcerative colitis. And for patients who are refractory to that or who have more severe flares, we may use corticosteroids. These are not for long-term use because they have a wide variety of uh, deleterious side effects. Uh, Historically, we had used a lot of immune modulators such as mercaptopurine or azathioprine uh, for very severely ill hospitalized patients who are steroid refractory. In the past, we had used cyclosporin, a very powerful immune suppressing medication in the short term. Um, But more recently, in the last 20 plus years, we've used a variety of biologic therapies, including anti-TNF antibodies such as infliximab and adalimumab, as well as golimumab. And in recent years, we've used vetalizumab, and finally, ustekinumab is also used, uh, shown to be effective in the treatment of ulcerative colitis. Should someone suffering with ulcerative colitis expect to be um, on maintenance for the remainder of their life? Yes. Uh, Unfortunately, all these medications suppress the inflammatory process, but they don't cure the process. And therefore, the best way of keeping the disease under control is to both induce remission as well as maintain that remission with ongoing therapy. So what would you consider the the current gaps in uh, the treatment space for those living with UC? Uh, We mentioned uh, lifelong maintenance. Um, During that maintenance, what types of challenges should one expect? Well, there, there are indeed a number of challenges in maintenance, and the first is that uh, patients have to be willing to accept the notion that they need to be on longer-term therapy uh, in order to control their condition. The second issue is the safety of long-term therapy. Um, You know, a variety of medications, I mentioned corticosteroids already uh, and how harmful they are. In fact, they uh, do have a risk of mortality with long-term use. Um, The anti-TNF antibodies are powerful and effective agents Um, however, do have an associated risk of infections and rarer risks of lymphoma and other important conditions. And so we've we've been looking for safer uh, but more effective therapies for long-term use. Mm -hmm. So durability of efficacy is is a key factor, and the safety of the medication is also an important factor. There was some data that was presented at the 16th Congress of Europe, uh, European Crohn's and Colitis Organization evaluating biologic induction and maintenance therapy. Could you uh, talk about that information that was presented, if you would? Yes. Well, I'll start by introducing your listeners to the UNIFI study, which was uh, a phase three study that led to the approval of ustekinumab, a biologic therapy that blocks 
interleukin-12 and interleukin-23 um, and has been shown to be effective in that phase three study for the treatment of ulcerative colitis for both induction and for maintenance. Those results were reported and published before, led to the approval of ustekinumab for the treatment of ulcerative colitis, and it already was approved for Crohn's disease, which is very similar inflammatory bowel disease condition. But the data presented at ECHO this year uh, speaks to the longer term safety and efficacy of ustekinumab for treating ulcerative colitis. And here, patients were followed in long-term extension out through a three-year period. And in two separate uh, abstracts that uh, were reported, the data suggests that ustekinumab has very good durability of efficacy, um, as well as very good steroid sparing effect. In, in other words, the drug is effective over three years and probably longer as we continue to observe these patients, um, has an excellent safety record, and very importantly, keeps people off of steroids. For those patients who entered into these trials on corticosteroids, uh, the vast majority were able to taper off or at minimum reduce to very, very minimal doses of corticosteroids. So even though they can forego the, the steroids, are there changes that need to be made in the medication throughout the patient's lifetime based on their uh, UC and its progression? Well, one of the things that we watch for is loss of response to therapy. And when that happens, we're obligated to change to a, a, another therapy in an attempt to control the condition. And what we're observing with ustekinumab and ulcerative colitis is that the vast majority of patients who make it through one year of treatment with maintenance therapy given subcutaneously every eight or every 12 weeks, the label in the United States is for every eight weeks of cutaneous dosing, those people who make it out to one year are very likely to make it out uh, in remission, I might add, out through two additional years, out to three years. Um, but when patients do lose response, uh, they will need to change to some other therapy that may be effective for them. Discuss the age group of the, the subjects uh, briefly, if you would. Were there any younger subjects? All the participants in the UNIFI study program were age 18 and older. Okay. Um, there were separate studies that have looked at pediatric uh, patient, age patients, uh, and I won't speak to those as those data weren't presented at ECHO. Is there anything that you'd like to add before you give us a website where we can learn more? Yes, uh, I, I think it's important for people to understand how impactful ulcerative colitis is for the, the individuals who suffer from it and how important it is to have effective, safe, and durable therapy, uh, such as we, we do see with drugs like ustekinumab. Um, these are conditions that uh, have modest effect on mortality, but have major impact on quality of life of patients. So anything that we can do to control these these, this condition and do it safely for the long term is going to be very powerful. Right. Well, give us a website where our listeners can go online and get some more information about UC and about some of these treatment options. Well, uh, one website would be the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website. Uh, they're a uh, well uh, curated website with very trustworthy information about the treatment of ulcerative colitis as well as Crohn's disease the two major forms of inflammatory bowel disease. Well, Bruce, I appreciate you joining us once again here on Health Professional Radio. Looking forward to our next conversation. Thank you so much. My pleasure speaking with you. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with returning guest, Dr. Bruce Sands. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Professional Radio.